Hello, this is Hakka Dabin, and today we are going to be reading SCP-6500. We are going to be continuing the path of the warrior. And by the looks of it, we might be finishing. Possibly. If you like this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right into this. The Black Vaults. Even as Re fell in darkness for or the second time that day, she didn't consciously close her eyes as she fell away from the light, but she did have to unconsciously open it when her feet touched solid ground again. She still couldn't see, and when she opened her, her mouth to calm that fact, she realized she was wearing a mask. She worked her fingers under the A edge and peeled it and peeled it off like a bad sunburn. It was a, it was a solid, featureless strip of white porcelain, like a well-worn bar of soap. Her companions stood beside her, holding their own masks and squinting into sudden brightness. She dropped the mask and held the shimmering sword aloft. Elcori leaned into examining it, stroking the cross guard longingly. This thing is just hemorrhaging magic, she whispered, awestruck. It's sure to be getting more powerful. Nothing gets more powerful anymore. Half the artifacts in our inventory have straight up failed. 2264 won't open. 005. I have had 963 are flat out dead, but not this thing? Maybe that's why the Magic City wanted us to have it, placeholder suggested. Maybe it really is part of the solution. Putting the genius and genius lo- Oh, see. Okay, I agree. Ed, here's hoping. Well, said Eddie Benes, it's a pretty shit sword, minus the art with the whoosh. She flew out for emphasis, then held the thing in front of her to illuminate their surroundings. Guess we're on a library crawl today, she muttered, a quarter of cramped black bookshelves stretched away to near infinity. She could almost sense the curvature of the earth in her er, immensity. Er, er, very cramped black bookshelves. Very, very. They all shudder as one, even as had a palpable sense that all the books are wrong. The shelves are wrong. <clears throat> she cut herself on the sud sharp side image of the charcoal sack splitting open with their expanding burden. Bursting in a hell of, we need to move, she said. She shook her head hard. We need to move before we start hearing voices? She merely strode forward. Come on. She didn't look to see if they were following. Have you come to steal our secrets? The voice was not weak, as the voice of Kayakori had been. The voice was strong, confident, ring with a tone of broken bells and empty wells. Rats to the poison. She walked faster, the shelves length and skyward like dead fingernails. The books were watching. They did not approve. Do you seek to know us? Do you seek to know yourself? Or do you seek valor obscenity still? The voice was a sneer, a mockery. It was also a raucous stream of laughter, sonorous and racking. She was naked in the dark. Delfina? A query from quite behind. Delfina, are you alright? You are come to our dwelling place! The shelves were closing in. There were no shelves. You are come to the terminus of all which is beautiful and ruined! Her footfall almost made no sound. 
you are come to Black Alagata, and you are welcome here. She stopped walking. She closed her eyes. Come to me, the voice sang. Come to me and end. This doesn't end. Her own voice startled her awake, and she opened her eyes. She was standing. The four of them were standing in a pool of... In a pool of latest tears. There were books in the water. Drowned catastrophic revelations. The words drifting off the sodden pages to swim beneath the tension. Even as knelt down in the mark and ran her, her fingers through a membrane between the venom and the... Enough! Her companions stared back as even as the shout echoed through the vast subterranean. All three of them staring at her reproachfully. Here is your knowledge, Bun chided. Drown in it, she blinked. Knowledge. She gazed into the pool, then reached in and scooped up one of the books. A 12th interior slot. Hold over her jumpsuit as she closed the cover. She couldn't read the words, but the lettering was, What remains when names died? She squinted. The lettering was, An imp, imp uh, amateur or of the madness within all of us. She took a deep breath, squeezed her eyes tight, and with one final time, the towel was as simple. Spoliation. She dropped it, and the water swallowed it it up without so much as a dew drop of protest. She scooped on another, rack and roses, another, the auspices of debauchery. The English words are served through the Isaiah Al Al Alagadan tongue like a well reaching the ocean. Of course, said O'Curry, kneeling to look over even as his shoulder. Alagadan scripts translates itself within the city. They stood together and the four of them closed a circle at the center of the pool. This was the archivist meant. She held the sword aloft and rotated it slowly. We had to go down to the source. The blade was a shaft of pure white light, so they could read the inscription with perfect clarity. Even as spoke it out loud, I will not fade. We'll see about that. Her third companion spat in the instant before she realized she didn't have a third companion. It fell upon her. The ambassador of Alagada dug into the flesh of her right hand with sharp nails, and she fell over backwards onto into the Isseus pool. Through the swirling murk, she saw the absence of a face. She fretted at her wrappings, radiating away like peeled off skin. I know you, Ed Cackle. <laughs> you are no hero. Her back broke the surface, though she could still see the frantic faces of a Cory and placeholder peering down at her. And she splayed out on the polished tile floor of Site 43's made elevator access corridor. A hundred vanished specters stalked towards her, and she found that the sword in her hand was now a sleek and shining high tech red rifle. Murderer! The nearest one spat, and she spat fire back at it. At the moment of impact, it transformed into a terrified woman in a security uniform. She spun away, both arms severed at the shoulders, blood splashing in the clean in white walls. Coward! cried next one, throwing back its hands in defiance. The woman it became disappeared in a red mist as even as pulled the trigger. Jailer! Jailer! was the final word from the advancing throng as even as scrambled back against the wall and sprayed them all with the same fire. They fell on her, blasted apart, blood soaking the tiles, until a clawed hand reached out and thrust her hand into the spreading 
in, in Clash. You are no savior. She emerged, a coughing, sobbing wreck from a stagnant pool of swamp water. The sky was on fire and planes roaring overhead. Pelting at a lagoon-side village with heavy artillery while white men and women in, in MTF outfits struggled to assemble an anti-aircraft gun. The torture in her, her hand had been snapped in half, but the incandescent and of he lit the expanding cloud of red in the water before her. A small girl lay face down in the muck, a single clean exit wound in the back of her skull. Even as reached down, finding the almost powerful, overpowering urge to drop the torch and turn over her sister's ice cold corpse. This isn't real! Her voice disappeared right into the throaty snicker of the, the faceless bandaged beast, which reached up and closed its talons around her throat. You are nothing. This time, she fought back, hammering at the ambassador with the broken torch. It seemed him taller, leaner, more confident as each blow landed. This isn't real, she screamed. This is a dream. Dreams are more real than autumn magic in Alagata today. The bandages fell away, and a leaf form of sheer night enveloped her. She felt her fingers loosen on the, the torch. The gun, the sword, and as the ambassador thrust her down in, onto the water once more, she understood what was happening. She took a deep, rattling breath as the pressure it began to tap its surface, cleared her mind, and focused on the only thing that mattered to her at the end of all things. Her failure at the fat mountain where ten good men and women lay dead. You are no leader. Razor sharp fingers stuck into her scalp, and her eyes filled with blood as she emerged into the moonlit, rain swept of landscape of, of Keakoi. She splashed through the fountain and space it, coughing up rainwater and gagging on, scalding out hot air. The beast stood on the, tur on the church steps, regarding her with an air of casual, impersonal malice. I could take you apart with a whisper. It crowed. But it's far more amusing to let you do it yourself. Fire, she croaked, and felt a rush of satisfaction as the ambassador her frozen confusion just before ten rifles, all was worth the poly hollow point ammunition tore it to sable shreds. Her agents emptied their magazines. The perforated monster took one step backward, then plunged face first down the stairs. She had the briefest glimpse of a white robe glowing crazily in the full scale behind it before the entire scene abruptly snapped into non existence. She was on all fours in the pool of in the endless pool of knowledge. Her enemy was face down in the water, whole but motionless. She loosened her grip on the sword and held it up behind her. She didn't see which of her friend and suck it. So focus it. It's what she on the savagely satisfying act of reaching out and snapping the hateful creature's neck. A sound like a single link of chain, shattering, rebound through the cavern, and she dragged herself out of the inky mire. A cord wordlessly handed her back the sword. It glowed like a beacon in the black. Whew. What the fuck was that thing? Placeholder was raving as they strode down the stone corridor. The ambassador of Alagada, Okori was calm, one of the most powerful sorcerers ever to walk the earth. Is it dead? It was dead to begin with. The mage looked rueful. Under normal circumstances, it could have disassembled as at the atomic level without batting an eye. Yeah, even as not, her voice was somber, but stronger somehow. It says much. That's why I had lost. She reached up to clean the blood, edge fell right down her face. Her hand came away clean. 
Villains never know how to read the room. Was that the villain? Placeholder interrupted. Oh, Cory, you called it an ambassador. Does it serve the hanged king? Don't say that name out loud, Okori winced. The answer is yes and no. It's complicated. Please sort of reach into his lab coat pocket. Do either of you know anything about character archetypes? They both shrugged as he produced his snare. Irritated fluctuation detector. Specifically, do you know what, what they call the big bad second in command? They shrugged again as he adjusted the dials on the device. They call it a dragon. Even as soft walking. Are you saying... I'm saying you pulled a sword out of a at you, saved a sovereign state, fought and maybe even slew a dragon, and... Uh, you started at the detector. Yeah, we're topping out the skills here. Even as sh shifted her weight impatiently. And that means, practically speaking, it means uh, we need to start writing this thing down, or we're going to draw the author sound to our level and get trapped in an eternally escalating narrative. As much fun as it would be to see you achieve her heroic apotheosis, there's still that small matter of a world it's like aving. Corey's eyes were glinting in sort in, in sort of light. Actually, on that topic, she reached out to touch a sword and jerked her hand back to suck her, on her finger. Oops. <laughs> she collects her thoughts. Are we clear on why this dead hunk of metal has been gradually approaching critical mass? It's twenty her protagonist's potential, said Placeholder. Even as stared at him, what? It's drawing strength from your heroism. Oi, Corey explained. No, scratch that. It's matching the strength of your heroism. The way a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a the say you called out for a hero and you answered, because of who you are. She collapsed even as his shoulders. We've come to Alagada from Turkey. Delfina by... And away. Hey, of the goddamn wanderers. There's a library. We didn't do that to read an inscription that didn't tell us anything useful. We did that to do it. The sword triggered a, a quest and the quest triggered the sword. Through your absurd sequence of strength feats. <sighs> Do you know how long it's been since someone's shifted the balance of power in Alagada? Akori asked. How long it's been since jailers walked free in the halls of the hand? How many decades it's been since and Keikoi spoke? She laughed. Or how long it's been since my veins felt full of fire? She was beaming, fit to shame the sword. That's what this thing does. It's reflecting what's inside of you, stirring the stories, bringing life to dead and dying places. For all we know, there's enough raw change built up in that led to reversing impasse entirely. Even as concerned as they reached the end of the corridor, a thick stone archway leading into an ample dark. Well, she said. Holy shit! <laughs> An empty dread settled over them as they crossed the threshold. They were sitting at the edge of a colossal rotunda, a coral reef of twisted pillars, tired banners, and cat as small oak alonades. Passages like the one they had just exited branched off in every direction. Legends and inner sigils carved above ebony tintails. The heart of the hall of the king, ain't king was a circular stairway to raise the dais, dominated by a rapid escalator throne sculpted with scenes and, and figures with, which crawled beneath their eyes like the memory of worms in the grave. It was littered with nasty looking spikes, broken links of black metal, and frayed lengths of black rope. A single chain hung from, an un from the unseen. Feeling, swaying in a breath of air which failed to disturb the dust coating every exposed surface. The throne was empty. 
Okori drew them back in the corridor. corridor. Her dusky features generally pale. We have a problem, she nearly choked on the words. The only way to leave Alagada is to pass through a door, a real door. She jerked her thumb over her shoulder. There might be one in here, but there are definitely doors in the city. So we head up and out? Even as felt her pulse rising. Akori shook her head. The king is free. I think you I think we freed him. <sighs> Even as raised aids the blade between them, and Okori shook her head more forcefully. You saw what I did to the ambassador. If the Hang King gets his hands on that, with nothing to hold him back, it won't need to we won't need to bother saving the world. You'll already be doomed. Placeholder was high ventilating. So we search urge the passages and hope we find a door? And if we don't, Evidence watch her friend's face carefully. A Cory turned away from her. Take a corridor. Any corridor and run. The light in the hall was curious. They could read the inscriptions over each passage, but the space across the dais and where the winding stairs to Alagada proper lurked was an unbroken pitch black. As they moved from doorway to doorway, staring down endless tunnels of lightless rock, they realized the shadows were neither lengthening nor shortening with the motion of their makeshift torch. They found a grand total of one door, a jet black wooden affair with a cyborg pattern of locks. A legend on the intel read, Aditum, and Okori wordlessly declined to try opening it. Teeth clenched and faces gaunt, they edged around the throne platform towards the entry and gloom where the gloom moved. Oh, said Okori. She raised into her satchel, withdrew a leveled other pouch, and poured its contents into her left hand. She clapped both hands together, and a cinema a cloud exploded around her. Goodbye. What? Even as he sees major shoulders. Okori's muscles were taut, and she planted her feet firmly in the grime. Okori scanned the tunnels frantically as Avenue tried to force her friend to face her. Okori rubbed her hands together until they were about to cut her full dress, then began tracing lines in the e lingering powder. Udo! Ibnez moved to step in front of Okori, and a taller woman turned around and shoved her roughly back. Her face was streaked with tears. You need to go! She nailed to draw lines into the floor with her fingers, carving an intricate design around her as a black haze billowed up behind her. An antimatter, her skin, an unraveling tapestry of absolute nothing. A multitude of tenebrous tentacles riding out towards them. Even as raised the sword, and Okori favored her with an anguished mouth before striking a fire between her thumb and forefinger and pressing it to the figures on the floor. A wall of flame erupted beneath her feet. But it was cool to the touch. But firm as solid stone. Okori murdered her friend's gesture, then pursed her lips, lips and pushed even as was hung back, sliding across the filthy slabs. A flake ace holder followed to her feet as she screamed, Udo! The space behind the firewall was now starless, moonless night. Okori raised both hands above her, her head, hill, air bellowing, muscles straining, and spine straight. The king's empty bulk forced her to back away bit by bit, edging beneath a lintel marked with the simple sign of three crescent moons. There was still a picture of perfect resolve when even as lost sight of her, propelled down a lightless passage, marked never meant by the distraught but insistent pataphysicist. I think this is the end. <sighs> They never meant. They had made it 50 feet before Evanez felt a violent urge to raise back to the throne room, stronger than the archivist's curse in the library, stronger than the pull of a moth to a flickering flame. 
We have to go back. Placeholder made no move to restrain her, but obviously knew his, his own strength. We can't. This is the only way forward. He ran about it and threw his dark curly hair. We need to get you out of here. We need to get the sword out of here. You're the protagonist. Akoria and I... No! Snapped Evenes. Akoria and I are just secondary e e e characters. He raised his hands up defensively. It's true. Evenes resisted the urge to slap him. She pointed back down the passageway. Don't talk past physics at me right now. My friend. My friend is going to die back there if I don't help her. <sighs> he shook his head sadly. No, she's going to die whether you help her or not. The question is, will everyone else? Even as bad her hands into fists. You know where this goes. For all you know, you're leading us down a dead end while Al Udo gets... She blinked back, furious tears. For nothing. Placeholder frowned on Gremlin as he tapped the narrative detector with one finger. I do know where this is going. Our goddess on the shores we never met. An interdimensional void, a space between spaces, where the collapse of magic, if my theories are correct, it's a realm of pure pataphysics, the domain of the authors. Even as blinked. If your theories are correct. <sighs> he nodded. I talked to Okori about this before we left Slot. Lot's pit. There was always a chance we'd get trapped in a loop out here, with our world so infused with narrative power. <sighs> He sighed. If that happened, we agreed to push things over the edge. She felt her jaw setting. Push things over the edge? He looked stricken. Check off another narrative box. Reel the authors in. Hit one final note on the cliches to go. Her wit and gaze dared him to say it, so he swallowed hard and obliged. A grand gesture. A sacrifice. He said that wrong. For a moment, she feared she might drive the radiant sword through his heart. For a moment, she thought she might dash him against the glistening black masonry. For a moment, she thought she might lose her mind. But hit then, her heart leapt into her throat, and a blinding light burst from the edge of the blade. It's not a fucking sacrifice! She stuck the tip of the blade directly under his nose. It's a sequel hook. At first, there seemed to be light at the end of the tunnel. It then became apparent that this was actually an absence of both light and darkness. A creeping cast of gray which swept all clarity and color aside. They ran through the dimming fog, even as sealing brief glances behind them. For a few precious moments, they were still in the void. The slime memor memorial to the uncertain fate of Udo Okori. But soon, not even the absence of anything remained. Their feet were falling on thick aisle carpet, casting clouds of dust through a starlit a gallery paneled in ivory maple. This isn't real, said Placeholder. I set firmly forward. There is fine anger burning beyond the, lead the lettered windows, and a sudden lamentation split the night with enough force to. They were running through a labyrinth of singing nettles. Staring up at a hollow sky, a noose was hanging from the heavens, a shapeless figure kicking at the end of the rope, breaking through the layers. The path as it snapped. Keep moving. They were barreling down a hazy, fence-lined street, rows of dead-eyed corpses hurrying to watch them pass. Trumpets stuttered on high. Something massive moved in the midst. Almost there, placeholder gasped, clearly out of breath. They were falling through an empty expanse again, and she suddenly knew she was being observed from beyond the veil. I never told you how I got my name, Placeholder remarked. His eyes were wide and wild as he pointed at the emptiness ahead. I got something's attention, and it cursed me. Is that a... No, it's not a story. They were pinned against a black velvet carpet, like... Carpet. Curtain. Wow. I was wondering why I was getting that wrong. Like butterflies on a specimen board. 
A bad physical mass looming over them. Reaching out to grasp. We've learned a two, thing or two about curses ourselves in the Ethereum. A howl of static, a sevenfold of shattering new change, an inhuman and rictus rising up be, behind them, and a scream from beyond the fourth wall, and. Village of uh, Kayakoi, Republic of Turkey. They were sitting side by side on an uncomfortable wooden pew. Gazing up at the white robed figure flying from the velvet, its robes were billowing in an unseen breeze. The end of the end is nigh. What was that thing? Her own voice sound flat, empty, alien to her. When the author came for us, it was a safeguard, placeholder muttered. Staring at the motionless needle along the stair to fluctuation to protect her, a last resort against the writers. If push came to shove, a contingency plan we never thought we'd need to use. He blew out a ragged breath. I deployed it in the Noah sphere before we left 87. Even Ness glanced at him, almost too exhausted to ask. Why didn't you tell anyone? He responded timidly, recognizing the fire in her eyes. Because then it wouldn't have found us. Because it wouldn't have been a deus ex machina. We have to follow the rules, you know. She glanced down at the blade. I will not fade. Gleamed like a burnished bronze and shook her head. Fuck that noise. She still haven't hit it for Devil Doors, finally ignoring the lingering genius Loki. The rules follow me, starting now. And the log. What is the one that we're gonna go to next? I forget. There are four paths that we can go to. Hang on. Addendum. Debriefing material. Resubmit and credentials to access post-mission reports regarding SCP-6500 A acquisition. Missing persons report. Dr. Udo Okori and Chief Delfina Ibanez. In the early days of the SCP-6500 crisis, we Foundation personnel embarked on a voluntary expedition to A. Acquire an, an anomalous artifact, B. Uncover the truth of its origins, and C. Determine whether or not it could be used to partially restore the status quo. This resulted in the acquisition of six of SCP-6500, I'm gonna say Alpha Sword, the leading edge. Said artifact is a blade capable of reflecting the inner strength of its bearer into thaumaturgical and narrative energy. Analyzing decayed anomalous landscapes and living creatures and restoring momentum to their stories. Dr. Udo Okori, chief of applied occultism at Site 43, was lost during the operation in the hostile and extremely hazardous city of Alagada and its presumed um, KIA. The bearer of SCP 6500 Alpha Sword, Site 43 Pursuit and Suppression Chief. Delfina Ivanez subsequently organized a mobile task force made up of individuals with exceptional protagonist potential. As identified by Site 87 and Pathesis, Dr. Placeholder McDoctorate. Chief Ivanez and MTF Delta 6500 Mystical or Mi Magical Mystery Tour were deployed to each foundation and site and a variety of foundation friendly anomalous locations in order to repair the damage done by SCP 6500 wherever possible. While local effects have been more extreme, generalized as through random global, no random global interstellar and interpersonal effects have also been redness. Select the inter intentional, desirable, unintentional, or undesirable, unforeseen restorations include SCP 
5923. The living village of Ayakoi uh, no longer subsists on the psychic energy of its innocence and has returned to contented hibernation. SCP-179. The self-proclaimed lookout has started to life and now points one finger directly towards the Earth. SCP-2922-C. 29- C. All contact with the afterlife known as Burbank was lost at the onset of the crisis but has become accessible once more. Group of Interest Alpha-19. Formerly dedicated to addressing the SP-65 crisis, a number of Greek ally serpents and Dharma's urges have resorted from their campaigns of attrition against the Foundation. SCP-1762 A single instance of SCP-1762 has been reported in the wild. Confirmation pending. SCP-6500 and Alpha Sword has been proven incapable of restoring most anomalies whose anomalous functions have fully ceased. Attempts by Delta 6500 to enter the Waters Library to re- their aid and assistance has been categorically rebuffed. No attempt has been made to return to Alagata for reasons which should not require ex- vacation. It was observed that at SCP 6500, a sword, can only draw a certain amount of power from each wielder before becoming inert in their hands. Chief Evanez therefore mandated retaining the use of the artifact between all members of Delta 6500. Utilizing their unique protagonistic profiles to infuse more abundant anomalous locations and entities with whatever variety of esoteric force they require to continue or resume their normal functioning. After one week of this activity, signing a sufficiently well trained and diverse task force capable of carrying out these actions indefinitely, Chief Evanez surrendered the artifact to Dr. Remick. A doctorate and nominate him temporary head of the task force. She requested a leave of absence to convey her to convey her condolences to Dr. O'Corey's parents. Researchers stationed at Site 91 in Yorkshire or England. This was granted. The do- Dr. O'Corey reported nothing unusual in Chief Evan as his activities during her time at Site 91. Nevertheless, on her return to London. Unintentionally to resume the E with Delta 6500, she was seen entering Her Majesty's Royal Palace Fortress at the Tower of London, and Fortress of the Tower of London, heavily armed. At which point, she disappeared without a trace. <sighs> Looks like next time. We'll be going through the path of the mage. That was the end of the warrior's path. If you like this this story, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I know what we're going to be doing tomorrow, so until then, goodbye.